Welcome to another episode of Big Risk Energy. I'm your host, Roy Samuel. For those who don't know me, I'm a serial entrepreneur, having founded multiple businesses, including one that I scaled and sold to a gaming company in 2018. I've been investing in startups for the last couple of years, and I'm very passionate about mental health and neurodiversity, suffering from severe ADHD and dyslexia myself. And on this podcast, Big Risk Energy, we talk to an amazing range of people, from academics to actors, investors to entrepreneurs, scientists, musicians, politicians, and everyone in between. And we talk to these people about risk, risks they've taken in their careers, risks they've taken in their lives, when those risks pay off, and when they don't. And on today's episode, I'm blessed to be joined by the one and only Gary Sachs, CEO of City and Docklands Group, co-founder of Life Ventures, and trustee of Grief Encounters and Norwood Charity. Gary, thank you so much for joining today. My pleasure. Although I don't fit into any of the accolades of intelligent or, <laughs> or, 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 or academic or any of that, but we'll give it a go. Well, over the next 40 <laughs> minutes, we'll prove that you're wrong and, and you definitely fit into a lot of these categories. So obviously now you're known for being super successful, building an amazing property portfolio, but I don't know how many people know about actually your origin story, which when we talk about risk, you know, finishing education in South Africa, moving to London with, with nothing. Tell us about that. Well, I, I left South Africa in 1987, and that to put in perspective, I think Nelson Mandela was re- released in 90-something. So um, it was kind of, I always knew that I was going to leave from the age of 15. And I, I, I went to university in Johannesburg, Witz, which was a pretty liberal university, saw some crazy stuff there of rioting and like the real powers of apartheid at work. Wow. And I, um, I, wrote, I did a Bachelor of Commerce degree and I actually left the day I wrote my, after I wrote my last exam. So I didn't wait for, I kind of figured I graduated, but I kind <laughs> of left and, I, and I, I actually went to America first for nine months. So oh, it was I was kind of, that. well, you know, that, uh, yeah, that was where like the big world started. Mm. And, and, um, and, then, and then I ended up here just for various reasons, and you know, I um, my my father was in a furniture business in uh, South Africa, and it's kind of all I really knew. And um, I, I opened up a small furniture shop in Kilburn, really kind of really small, fifteen hundred square foot, second hand furniture and carpets. And but what I did realize was that there were two two properties that there were more. There were actually three. There were more than any of them in in London. And that was um, churches, mm-hmm. pubs, and estate agents. Okay. Exactly. And I thought, if I can make some money in any of those three, there must be scalability. Um, and uh, I was literally on a side street in Kilburn. And what I started realizing, I wasn't going to make money in anything from the church, and I didn't really understand the pub business. So um, I started going around to all the estate agents in Maida Vale, St. John's Wood, and offering to furnish flats for them mm. and so you can have a commission if you did it and and, and it started working slowly but surely and then um, I knew that um, the Chinese Hong Kong Chinese mm-hmm. were buying properties in London investment and I thought you know I may as well go and have a look and I, I, I took myself to Hong Kong economy stayed at the YMCA <laughs> and I went around knocking on the doors of state agents I went to the uh, Hong Kong used to have a high commission here called in Dover Street and I kind of went to the yellow page and took all the addresses out of the estate agents. And I went door to door selling estate agents and, and selling, you know, furniture packs. And actually, the last one that I called on gave me a very nice audio. Just sold the development in uh, Victoria by the Channel. Mm-hmm. I think it's the Channel Four building, Channel Five building. And um, and that kind of opened my eyes up to how we could do business. The one order was more than I was turning over in a year. And eventually, I managed to get. I, I, I always try to get to the source of the, 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 of the well, of the fountain. Mm-hmm. And I started getting onto all the exhibitions for the developers. So when developers would go to Hong Kong to sell their, um, their properties, I would be at the exhibition yeah. selling a furniture pack. And that built. And then I kind of thought, how could I be kind of um, uh, 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 get into the depths of the margins? And I started, what I'd do is after an exhibition, I'd go into China mm-hmm. and I'd start buying the furniture in China. So my margins were really, really strong. Yeah. And then what happened was, just through understanding the market, a bit of market intelligence, you, you start understanding how people are buying, what motivates them to buy, etc. And what you found was that people were buying 
it was such a feeding frenzy that people mm. were buying not on the basis of what the investment was, but what the basis of the price list was. So in mm. other words, if you had a one bed priced at under 200,000 versus a two bed at 300,000, well, you knew what was going to sell. Mm -hmm. So we started buying the lost leaders. Interesting. You know, so the, the developer would put on a uh, one bedroom flat 199,000. And, and was that something you discovered by trial and error? Or was that, you know, gut telling you we're going to sell it this way? You're in the market, you're in the market, you understand yeah. it. So we'd buy it yeah. and we'd sell it the next day for a profit. And, and it, it was much easier in those days because today you, it's much harder to flip a property. Mm. Than Why in is those that? Days. Because it caused the property prices to go up and they've tried to make it a little bit more difficult. The problem that we have in the housing market now is not so much over trading, it's just under supply. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. Um, and, and anyway, and, that, and that's how it grew. And then from buying one flat, it got to buying five flats, 10 flats, and I bought a whole development off plan, sold that. Then I thought, well, hold on, if we can do this, maybe we can make some more money by if we actually build them ourselves mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and sell them. And that's what we did. And then we grew. And now we're probably going through the final phases where you turn around and say, well, actually, I'm not going to sell them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to build them and I'm going to keep them. I'm going to rent them out. Because I learned something, a very clever guy, very, very wealthy, very successful South African, lives in London, once said to me, he said that he'll do business with me because he knew my reputation was good, but he didn't know how clever or stupid I was. But he said it didn't matter because even stupid people can make money in property, just don't sell it. That's but great. that's obviously a lot of capital requirement. <laughs> yeah, and it takes course. time to get capital requirement. Yeah, of course. And that's my story is relatively simple. It's 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 an amazing story. I mean, when you when you condense it down into into five minutes, you you're probably giving us the tip of the iceberg there, which I understand. But one of the things that you said to me when we spoke, it might have been back end of last year, which really stuck with me because most people I speak to in property are actually very risk averse. You know, they like like bricks and mortar. They don't like to take risks. And you said something to me which was. No matter what's going on in the market, if you're not moving forward, you're moving backward. Correct. Is that still something you see now with everything going on in the world at the moment? Is that, does that change your view on anything? <laughs> well, actually, that was said to me by my father, which I always kind of used as a motivational skill mm. to me when I felt like standing still. Yeah. I could have thought, if I'm standing still, I'm not going forward, so I better go forward. Um, there are some times that you should sit on your hands. Um, I think, I think the, the, the asset class of property and, and you have to be specific because, you know, property in Johannesburg, for example, is not as stable as in London. Sure. So you have to pick your market. So assuming a stable market, property is a, a pretty stable product. What makes it unstable is the amount of debt you take against it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you overgear and interest rates go up like we see now, mm -hmm. that becomes... So, it's, so the actual core asset is as stable as you're going to get. Mm -hmm. Probably the most stable. Okay. It's how you treat that asset, which can destabilize it or keep it stable. Really okay. interesting. Yeah. Really so, interesting. so, but there, but there are ways to mitigate that by fixing interest rates. I mean, we fixed a lot of our interest rates two years ago because I'm of an age where in South Africa, I saw 25% interest rates. Wow. Okay. And in England, 10 and 15, and we've got a whole generation now. What's the highest interest rate you've seen? Uh, previously? like Ever. Ever. In your lifetime. I think like 2%. Okay, so for me, my thinking has got to be 10%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's what makes the world go around, the yeah. 10% number. So, so, so you can mitigate those mm -hmm. risks, but the underlying asset or property mm -hmm. is, is safe. Really safe interesting. Houses. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly that. <laughs> and so it's a really interesting transition or, or addition, I should say, from you know, property as an asset class into pretty much the riskiest asset class you can get into, which is investing in startups, right? Because we're talking about illiquidity, we're talking about really a very little idea on what's going on within the underlying asset. How did you end up investing in startups and taking on that type of risk? Because like I said, even stupid people can make money in property. <laughs> you know, the truth is, why do you get involved in these things? I think you get involved in them for the excitement, mm -hmm. okay? Um, Truth be told, you should stick to your knitting, okay? But then you start making money from, from that, and, and, and obviously the, the, the base investment in mm -hmm. property is much bigger mm -hmm. than what we're investing into startups, etc. And I guess having a bit of spare cash, the initial reason for a startup, because you don't want to be the idiot that didn't get involved in Google, etc., etc., and, and people get carried away with 
that concept of mm. the unicorn. FOMO, right? It is. Yeah. It's actually, you just, you just don't want to be left out. Yeah. Um, over time, you then start realizing, actually, you can form a strategy around this. Um, and, and we've seen a lot of change over time. And, and I know that the successful startups that we've invested in have really always come down to the people mm. and what the pitch is at the beginning. Interesting. Okay. The pitch is at the beginning. It's what the pitch is we've learned to interpret, interpret what the pitch is. So if someone comes in and says, I want to be, my, my business is worth, I'm doing X revenue or, or, or my, 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 my add-on rate is X, mm -hmm. my business is worth 10 million pounds. And I look at them and I think to myself, you know, I have businesses we have an estate agency business. It's turned over 18 million over the last 10 years. Okay. And, it's, and on a multiple basis, it's worth about a quarter mm -hmm. of what you're asking mm -hmm. for. So how do you justify it being 10 million? But I think that's changed now, right? Mm -hmm. so, and none of those companies that come in and say, the company's worth X and we're going to exit for Y, we don't get involved in it anymore. Interesting. Okay? Because it's all... Excuse the French. No, you go for it. Yeah, it gets a thumb suck. Yeah, the successful ones we've come into, of which you know a couple, have come in and said, "I've got this great business idea. I need this amount of money to do it. What are you going to charge me? How much do you want?" And those are the ones who've been successful, th that have been successful. So you kind of, after a while, just it's not so much about being clever about mm. the industry. Mm -hmm. It's about seeing who you're dealing with and mm. seeing what the reality is. So the, the kind of interesting part is when I first started doing it, I, I put in money because I was relying on someone else yep. putting money in and they'd done the information. Mm -hmm. What I then learned was they were relying on me because they thought I'd done the information. So now we're more analytical. Mm -hmm. okay? and, 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 and when we set up Life Ventures, I actually said I'm going to judge the value of the business, not by how much we make, but how much I don't put in. So all the deals that come to us and you say, don't put that in because this is the flaw, that's my saving. That's very interesting. Okay. So are you tracking companies that you pass on as well? Not personally, but I'm sure our guys are. Yeah, okay. Josh, as you know, Josh, I'm sure, I'm sure they are. Um, I'll ask it, Josh. It's a very, it's a, yeah, yeah, correct. <laughs> yeah. It's a very, um, I look at it as a really old cynical guy. Yeah. Okay. I'm the cynic that says, you know what? I've heard this before. I've seen this before. Life doesn't really change, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the tech business or, or, or going for the, uh, these things is like, um, it's like the oil business mm -hmm. historically. Mm -hmm. So what's actually happened in the world? One business that we've invested in, and uh, it's not really fair to, to mention names, but they're actually doing very well. It's mm -hmm. in the legal, mm -hmm. legal mm -hmm. tech. And, um, but on their report, which looks great, at the end says runway uh, or, or cash out, I think was the other term they yep. used. And I'm thinking, in my day, that meant going bust on <laughs> losing money. Cash is king, but we didn't realize it. Yeah. We thought uh, if turnover, you know, the old, the old saying of, of course. turnover is vanity, profit sanity, uh, yeah, yeah. Is, is sanity and cash mm -hmm. flow is reality. So those terms like cash out, runway, I'm the cynic that looks and says, you mean that's when you're going bust when you run out of cash? Yeah. Whereas they become accepted terms. Yeah. So someone might buy a company into a company because their runway is three months longer. Yeah. And that's not a great point of reference for an investment. No, it's really interesting. But you learn over time and you learn. So for me as a cynic, I look at the people like you. Mm -hmm. I look at you and you know what? When you came to us and you started saying, we're very small shelves. Mm -hmm. We wish we were bigger, to be fair. But, um, you, the, you know. Next round. Next yeah, round, Gary. Yeah. Don't worry. Well, it depends on your valuation. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't realize there's a whole setup for me to knock your valuation down. Um, but um, you, you just, you have to look at it. What, what is proven to me? In, is that history doesn't really change, mm. okay? People fundamentally don't change. People's uh, uh, desire to, 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 to earn money, steal, be jealous, mm. be nice, hasn't changed since, Human, since humanity, humanity is started, still, yeah, right? Absolutely. So if you kind of analyze how people think mm -hmm. and then you go through the whole process, you, you can develop how your way of thinking, right? So if you've got someone that is very focused on their business mm -hmm. rather than 
the valuation mm -hmm. and how much they might exit for. Mm -hmm. That's much better for me. That's more important yeah. to, to, to go. Well, absolutely. I, I think that's a really, really interesting point. And so many good points in that. One thing um, re really interesting, my dad says to me when I told him, you know, we're burning 25K a month or something like that, he said that would give him sleepless nights. You know, he could never imagine being involved with a business, losing money. Because and in his mind, he doesn't think it's his money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, and I'm point, when I say you, I'm being very generic. Yeah, yeah, not yeah you. of course. But you guys aren't dealing with the money. You yeah. walk in and you say, my business is worth 10 million. I've, for my business to be with that money, I've sweated. Yeah. Okay, I've sweated. And, yeah. and Rome wasn't built in a day. Yeah. And I think it's one of the reasons we see investors who really like founders who put in their own cash as well. If you put in your own cash at the start, uh, one of our other largest investors, Nigel, says for him that's a prerequisite. You know, he wants the person steering the ship to have something to lose. I, I agree, and it sounds great, but what happens if that guy's got a really brilliant idea but no cash? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, so uh, each one has to be judged on its own. Totally true, totally true. We have That's a mutual just... friend that came to there, no cash, I put all the cash in. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, when we did a second round, mm -hmm. I didn't take equity, I put it in as a debt piece. Yeah, I remember. Because I have such faith in them. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's proved you right. You talk about focus and as well. Proved, and I it's mean, proved right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, life is, there's no blueprint yeah. for these things in mm -hmm. truth. Okay. So with that in mind, obviously when you're looking at a property development project, you have a very, very clear and you know, detailed understanding of how you're going to assess the risk around this. Can, well, for, well, yes, it's really easy. Yeah. For me, it's really easy. On, on okay. the startup side, can you apply any things? You mentioned people, you mentioned the pitch. Is there anything else that when you're looking at risk there that you can do to startup, make you feel well, better? Well, on a, uh, well, let's just go back to the property mm. side because it's easier to explain. So, so you have a developer that traditionally will do a, a P&L projection mm -hmm. and you'll say, I'm going to sell it for a thousand pound a square foot and mm -hmm. it's going to cost me 400 or 500 to build and finance and such and such and that's what it is. What is his risk? Uh, whether he can sell it or not, right? Correct. Mm. Okay. And what's the antidote? What is the antidote if he doesn't sell it? Uh, the value of the asset itself. No, but what is that value? Uh, I guess what someone's willing to pay for it. Well, know. well, it's an interesting point because yeah. valuations is what how the property market runs yeah. around. So you can have a valuation of X from one value, what they call a red book valuation, okay. what a bank relies on. Right. Okay. Okay. The real value of that property is the rent it takes in. Interesting. Okay. okay. It's the rent because that's the income. Yeah, okay. makes sense. So I don't value my properties anymore. Mm. It's whatever the value is, I look at the rents. Mm. So when I do a calculation for a development, I first look at the rents because we've tracked rents for the last 25 years and rents, the only time I've ever seen rents go down in London, well, twice now, but the first time was 9-11. Mm -hmm. And then if you think the reason that that happened was because the government dropped interest rates to 1%. There was no restriction on mortgages. So Everybody, and literally, the dog were buying properties. Yeah, yeah. So it was much cheaper to buy than to rent. So mm -hmm. rents went down. However, after about nine months, they recovered. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now with COVID, you mm -hmm. saw pockets like Canary Wharf drop. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But they recovered. And now is the busiest rental market I've ever seen in my entire time yeah. in property. So if you then, as a developer, shift your risk profile, mm -hmm. and you say, can I buy that land? And if it all goes wrong and I have to rent it out, mm -hmm. will I lose the property? No. So... If I then sell it at a good price, well, second price is pretty good, mm. okay? But that's why we've never ever lost money in a property because of that. So it's the same risk as the other guy's taken, but my attitude towards it is slightly different. Uh, because mm -hmm. that guy, when it comes down, he can't sell it, he's going to sit and he's going to burn more marketing money, yeah. burn more marketing money, and wait to sell and pay interest. I'm going to rent it. Yeah. And I can tell you, I learned it. I learned the hard way. Mm. We had a scheme in um, 2008 in Canary Wharf for 650 units. Mm -hmm. And, and we, it was financed by a club of banks, um, Bank of Ireland, Barclays and Deutsches. Bank of Ireland was the lead bank. And um, so when, the, when, that market, when the markets crashed, we had 300 sold to the Far Eastern markets, mm -hmm. 300 sold to the Irish market. The Irish market, no one completed. The, East, the Far Eastern markets, everybody completed, mm. but I was left owing the bank 150 million. Wow. Okay. And um, what you yet. had was all, and, and the Irish government took over the debts, mm. Norma, because of the Bank of Ireland, they took it over. So they became our bank. And most people in the sector were going to the Irish bank to Norma and saying, you know, we'll pay you 30p in the pound. We didn't have that luxury. We didn't have cash to be able to do that. And I knew as the asset manager, I knew the best thing was to rent it. Mm. I also knew that if I asked the bank, okay, They'd say no. Why? Because I would have 
I would have made their security harder mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. for them to take it and sell it on to someone would be more difficult. Yeah. And that was a great lesson that I'd learned before. Don't ask a question if you might not like the answer. So That's a great I'll, life lesson. So, so, correct. So I, I thought to myself, well, if, if I don't ask them and I just do it, and they find out, I'm in no worse situation, yeah, but I know in my yeah. heart it's the right thing. Yeah. And we rented everything out. So what the end result was, was when we got an interest bill mm -hmm. from Norma, we paid it, because mm -hmm. we had the cash flows. We mm -hmm. paid it. Remember what I said about cash being yeah, yeah. reality. Okay, we paid it. They ignored us. We were one of the very few companies that paid Norma back in full. So that kind of said, okay, let's look at to rent it. And so, okay, so that's really interesting. So, you know, with property, it's clear you have that mitigation of risk, because if it doesn't sell, you can rent startups obviously you know there is often no plan b so with that as just something that you've come to be comfortable no, with or no, no it's really simple mm. okay so when we started mm -hmm. we invested in a property based um like a zoopla yep. take on okay and we ended up being the biggest shareholders mm -hmm. in the, the 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 startup and every time they're running cash does either crystallize your loss or put money in, mm -hmm. and we put money in. It obviously got to a point where we said, forget it. So we took that away. But then what you realize is, how do you, you, you can't mitigate the risk for the starter. Mm -hmm. But as an investor, I can mitigate my risk. Mm -hmm. But instead of saying, I want to get a massive, I want to get a unicorn, I'd rather say, if I get 10 to 20% of my money in a basket, yeah. okay, I'm really happy. Yeah, so you've yeah. got to say, right, what's the chances or the percentage of a startup working? What's it, one in 50? One, I don't know. One, is there a number they, that anybody they, works They to? estimate 97% fail. Okay. They so you that. need to invest in 100. Yeah. And hopefully your three work. And if, the, ones, yeah. and if those three work, then, and you end up with 15 or 20% return. Well, that's yeah. a good fund. I've got an interesting question for you because with different investors that we've spoken to here, this 97% failure rate, I'm not sure if that's true. And I don't know if, if you look at the businesses well, you well, guys have invested in. What you consider failure? Um, going to zero. Okay. Going to zero. So close up. Yeah, to, exactly. Wound the company up, liquidation, whatever it might be. But I'm yet to speak to an investor who has that failure rate, where it's, it's that small. Do you think it's no, that? No, no one tells you all their failures. Yeah, okay. So you, do you, can you buy into that 97% fail? So I thought mine's about 100. <laughs> No, I, yeah, I mean, the point I think that you have to take from that, you can't say 80, 90, yeah. 97. The point is majority fail. Mm. You, but what happens is the press and all the advertisers are great all about the good ones. You always hear about the unicorns mm -hmm. in this, but you don't hear about the failures because mm. people keep them quiet. I can tell you loads. Yeah, really of interesting. Failures. So, so, what, so what we did was instead of putting 100,000 into one, we're putting 10,000 into 10. Mm -hmm. We're not the biggest shareholders, mm -hmm. okay? We can decide if we want to reinvest or yeah, not. Of course. We're not going to kill or starve the business. Yeah. And if those 10 make us, if we then earn 120,000 mm -hmm. pounds, but we have got a couple that potentially, we've probably got four that potentially could be very, very big. Really interesting, okay. So I've got a few questions that I ask every guest that I would love to, to go through with you. We talk about risk. What's the biggest risk you think you've taken in your career or your life and, and how did that turn out? It's really simple. I've thought about this because as much as he makes you think he surprised me, he did send me these questions. So I have <laughs> got time to think about them. And the truth is, I worked it out. The biggest risk is the first risk. Because okay. if you didn't take that first risk, you would never have the opportunity to take the second risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at any point in time, anything you do is a risk, but your first risk could arguably be said your biggest risk. Mm -hmm. because, so what was your first risk? Because your first risk is, well, my first risk, I guess, was coming here mm -hmm. and opening up a furniture store. Yeah. Okay. But, but just so we can get some perspective on this, because I don't want to think this is the thing of a uniform. I sat in that furniture store working six and a half days a week mm -hmm. for five, six years mm. before I really started making money. Yeah. You know, yeah. you guys your age are a little bit less patient mm. now. But at that time, there wasn't that kind of money. I couldn't go to someone and say, oh, I have this aspiration to build a furniture business, put in a 10 million pounds. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, 
I can name you lots of risks I've taken. What I will say to you is the risks I've taken are not do or die risks. Mm -hmm. They always they always calculate. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody says, "Oh, you crazy, do this," but they calculate. As you can see we work on the rental figures. Yeah, we do things. I guess probably if I really put it down, when I bought my first big development off off plan, mm -hmm. that was a big risk for me. Because Which one was that? Do you remember? It, it was in. Um, well, I bought one in Listen Grow, but then I bought in Limehouse. I okay. bought a scheme from Bellway Homes in Limehouse, and I basically used all the money that I'd made in my previous scheme. And at that mm -hmm. point in time, I thought I was a king, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, from being in a rented house, I knew I could buy a house, etc. That was a risk. But then every time you do is risk, what happens is as you grow, your risk can become smaller relative to your yeah, entire thing. Of course. And that's why I go back to saying the first risk that's is the hardest risk, because the first risk changes your life. Mm, that's interesting. And if it goes wrong, it's everything. Whereas now the risks I take, if they go wrong, I'll be pissed off, but in an it's not absolute perspective, yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. We'll okay. Really about. interesting. So on the on the flip side, yeah. What's one thing that you wish you'd done differently in your career? Really, again, really simple. Yeah. I wish I'd listened more and talked less. As I said, God gave you two ears and one mouth. Yeah, I use okay. the saying all the time. I, 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 I talk way too much. I said, but that's with the with the hindsight of age mm -hmm. and a bit of wisdom, you realise that. So, I guess. That's probably, but I've also learned not to look like that. You can't do it. at any point in time. You make decisions in your life on various reasons, mm -hmm. and then you go back and you analyze and say, mm -hmm. what did I do wrong? And you try and kind of improve yourself. Mm -hmm. But there's so many circumstances. So, but I think that's really, so like, like there's a reason people have non-exec directors with gray hair yep. because age and experience counts for more than anything. Yeah. In my opinion. Totally. Especially if you do believe that history is cyclical. Right, if it's happened before and it's going to happen again, the, having the, that experience no is clear. Question. I mean, how do they? How do they? How do you explain biblical stories that mm. have absolute relevance in today's world? Mm. Because well, it goes it back to what you're saying before. Human humanity is the same, the same. as it was six thousand years ago. So we still I, have I, the same drives. If I, if I would at some point like time like to go back to university, mm. and I'd like to understand the psychology and the relation of psychology to economics. Mm. Okay, because you can say, well, I, you know what, I'll sell you this cup, but you might not like white cups. Or there's someone might be, a, you know, the, you can't choose. And COVID's a great mm -hmm. example mm -hmm. through a lot of like way people think on its head. Mm. Okay. Totally. So, uh, And you still see it now, you know, people buy from people, people trust people. And it's, it, I always think about this, you know, are the Zuckerbergs, are the Bears, are they just still, you know, the same we'll animals take, of we'll 6,000 years take, ago take trying Facebook. to build out their resources? Take Facebook, and I don't really know that much other than the movie I've seen. Sure. He didn't go in it with the intention to make money. Yeah. Okay. Mm. That's when I'm saying to you that when they come back and say, oh, it's worth X million, etc., it was different. Zuckerberg went and said that at that but he already had yeah. something that was growing at a pace. It was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. But when he started off, he did it out of passion for computing. Well, it's interesting. You talk about you know humanity. Originally, he wanted to find girls to date. Correct. That's what his, his actual Correct. initial driver was. Correct. So you talk about humanity being the driver Correct. of all those things. That's probably another great example. Correct. Okay, so a uh, third question I've got for you is, what is the thing that you're proudest of <laughs> in your career? Uh, okay, you added in a thing because you're going to say, what am I proudest of my family? Okay. Okay. That, that's Great. really because ultimately everything you do goes around mm. uh, um, maybe proving to your parents you could, wanting your children to be proud of you, etc. Because mm -hmm. it gets to the point where it's not really the money. You know, you can you you, you can only live in one house. You mm -hmm. can only. Well, looking at the two of us, we both got the memo. So I wouldn't say three <laughs> meals a day. We could eat a few more, but but you know what I mean. It's, it's yeah. limited. So so it, I guess. It's a drive, but the proudest thing is that you can do all that and have that family around you mm. and, and bring your kids up with the correct kind of attitudes, etc., to life. And you know, and other than that, I, as you know, I'm quite involved with charities, and, yep. I, and, and I do have quite a strong sense of social uh, um, kind of understanding. I, I, I realize how lucky I've been. No matter how much you think I'm clever, in this, it's about luck. Mm. Okay, I know people that are much cleverer than me that did exactly the same model, but. Luck just didn't happen in their way. I'm lucky. I mean, now we're starting to rent out a building and it's the busiest rental market. Yeah. Okay, that's luck. So, 
when you realise how lucky you are and then you realise how the same person might just be hard on their luck, we have to give back. And what you're seeing in the world today is, of course, is the people, the rich are getting richer, yep. the poor are getting poorer, and unless the rich realise they have a social responsibility, that's when you have the decline of civilization. So, you know, and I think that's probably also what I'm proud of, that I've yeah. spent my time doing stuff like that. Do you think your experiences in South Africa at young age influence the way that you see you know, justice and society and fairness? Uh, I'll be honest, I don't think so. When I lived in South Africa, you, you kind of, it, it was at a point when time was kind of the status quo. Mm. And so you don't even realize the wrongs of it because you must remember it's also a country that kind of kept the media out. And, yeah, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and when I went to university, mm. then 100%, you start mm -hmm. realizing it. When you come here, you do to some degree, but you know, there's also reality to life, mm -hmm. and you have to accept. I'm a realist as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you really say, like, for example, my view on the, the social uh, uh, um, justices, I don't believe that I need to be poor, mm -hmm. okay, for yeah. someone else who had a better life. Of course. I believe that if I have that ability to make money, which someone who might not have, it's my duty to not give everything, mm -hmm. but help that yeah. person and and through and biggest thing is through education yeah well okay. that's uh, the biggest thing as you said just then which i think is a a, a great example of it you know it, when you went to university you realize what's going on correct. that's the power of education right correct and and that's the only way you can take people out of a yeah difficult situation yeah is through yeah. education fascinating and gary i know because you've got to run as well my last question for you is what does it take to be successful well, it's the famous Churchillian saying that success is the ability to go from one disappointment and failure to the next without losing enthusiasm. Okay, that's Love the truth. That. Yeah, and another great one is Richard Branson said, it's much more fun being an optimist than a pessimist. Mm. Okay, so you just got to keep going. You've got to ignore what people say. You've got to take your gut feel and, and go for it. And, and, you, the, and I'll tell you something. The biggest... The, the, the most important thing to understanding, if you want to be successful, you have to be prepared to live outside your comfort zone. So if you are sitting there, n sleeping at night, thinking oh, nothing's wrong, you're in a bad position. <laughs> totally. That's the truth of yeah. it, right? That's what they say. Bravery is not about not being scared. It's about being scared and doing it anyway, right? Correct. Well, you, always, you have to accept you're going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. There's, there's very few of these guys that go and, put down on red, and red comes up every time. It, it doesn't happen like that. You go, and it fails even today in my business, okay? Every single day, I'm faced with like, typically when I say to myself, oh my God, at my age, I've had enough. <laughs> and I always say, right, that's it, I'm not gonna do another deal, yeah. I'm quite comfortable, I don't have to do anything. And I think, so, oh, but I'll be bored in about half an hour. Okay, so you go and do the next thing. Okay, yeah. maybe my risk profile is a bit less. Yeah. So it's less risky, but less nervous. Yeah. Still aggravates me. Yeah. Doesn't matter even if, you know, it's not even about, it's about losing. Mm. You, you kind of want to, it's also not about winning. You know, it's not a case of winning. You want to be successful. You want to feel mm. successful within yourself. Yeah. So, and I think that's it. It's just, you've got to just take the knocks and roll with it. Gary, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. Thank me. you very much. Nice one. Cool.